Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and this is another edition of Comfort's Corner, where we bring you the inside story and what's happening in and around the transit industry. Today, our focus on this episode is on inclusion and equity in public transportation. We've got a great episode for you. After some headline news, we've got a really good interview with Julie Tim, who is the CEO of GRTC in Richmond, Virginia, the transit system there. I recently visited with her on my road trip south. It was the first stop of my visit. was so impressed with what she was doing. And then she spoke just recently at the Trapeze Think Transit Conference eloquently about how they are moving toward remaining a fare free system. And she walks through the details of how they did the analysis, how it makes sense financially for the agency to improve equity and inclusion, and also for the economic development of the region. It's a great 15 minute discussion that she gave at our Think Transit conference. And then afterwards in part three of the show on the future of public transportation, I've been thinking about this whole idea of adding in more equity and inclusion into transit and the role it plays. Most of you know, I started my career in public transportation as the transportation coordinator for the Queen Anne's County Department of Aging. So in my heart, I've always seen public transportation as a way to improve equity and inclusion for those who needed it. First, the elderly, then people with disabilities, and now those who are maybe traditionally underserved. I'm excited about some thoughts I put together. I want to share them with you today in part three about the role of microtransit and mobility and demand in ensuring that we have better equity and inclusion. And I'd like your input and feedback on this as I start developing my thoughts. I think it's an important concept to talk about and I want your feedback. I I was so impressed at our Think Transit conference hearing from Robbie Mackinnon, the CEO of Kansas City Area Transit Authority who talked about using this opportunity of the COVID crisis, how it hit the pandemic, hit transit so hard to reevaluate what are we doing? Why are we in this business? And I think, it's, I think it's not just to move people from A to B as fast as possible and as safely as possible. I think we're all coming to the basic conclusion that it's to help people, everyone, and to make sure that no one is left behind, especially those who may be vulnerable. And then, of course, Alex Wiggins, who is the CEO of uh, New Orleans Transit, a good friend of mine, shared passionately about how they are looking at everything through the lens of equity and inclusion in his uh, discussion at the final keynote speech on day three of Think Transit. And I listened to that again over this last weekend, and I was just so impressed with it. And I'm actually working with Alex to uh, kind of further my thoughts on this topic so we can uh, begin to talk about in a thought leadership way about how we can move this industry to make sure that that's a big part of the conversation. So that's what we hope to look at today, plus great visits from Alea Carey and Mike Mike's Minute, as we always have. Really enjoy this tight 30-minute package today. I know you're going to uh, learn a lot today and enjoy Transit Unplugged. And now look at our headline news. Uh, big news out of New York City. Most of you may have heard it, but Governor Cuomo announced that the New York City subway will resume 24-hour day service beginning May 17th. In April, Uh, The transit officials announced more than 2 million trips were recorded on the subway on April 8th, the first time more than 2 million trips were taken on the subway since the onset of the pandemic in New York City. The MTA will continue its unprecedented disinfection and cleaning effort. More than 75% of MTA customers recently surveyed agreed the subway has never been cleaner, and the resumption of 24-hour service will coincide with the governor's announcement lifting the 12 a.m. food and beverage service curfew for outdoor dining areas. So great news. Most of you know that New York MTA is the largest transit system by far in the country. Prior to the pandemic, they were taking 35 to 40% of all riders every day. And so seeing them kind of returning to uh, normal by getting back to 24 hour seven service is a good uh, harbinger of things to come. Great news for my friend, Clement Michel. Keolis, he's the CEO of Keolis North America, he was, and they've, uh, uh, he's just been promoted. Clement Michel has served as president and CEO of Keolis North America since 2016. And he's been named uh, Senior Executive Vice President of Human Resources and Transformation, effective May 3rd. He'll lead the group's health and safety, employee engagement, and sustainable development policies. And Annalise Averill has been named Senior Executive Vice President of Marketing, Innovation, and New Mobilities, effective June 7th. The, uh, a great quote about Clement was that Clement Michel's operational and multicultural track record, as well as his experience in strategic development, operational transformation, and employee engagement, 
will be invaluable assets in driving the group's transformation, notably by harnessing our fast-growing expertise in digital innovation and energy transition. Our employees are Keolis's most valued resource, and it's their expertise and commitment which will ensure transformation delivers new opportunities. And uh, so congratulations. Uh, Clement has had 22 years of experience in passenger transport and the manage of public transport networks. Um, he held several positions in Paris and Montpellier and um, became the executive director of the Gare de Lyon station in Paris. In 2009, he joined Yara Trams, operated by Keolis Downer in Melbourne as chief operating officer before being appointed CEO of Yara Trams in 2013 a role in which he remained until moving to Keolis, North America. I've been down there and visited his operation a couple of years ago after he left, and uh, just a great operation. Congratulations to Clement. As you know, he's been uh, one of the founders and integral in our North American Transit Alliance. You're probably aware of that. He's uh, the current vice chairman of the group, and uh, we're very excited for him as he moves on in his career to this great new um, great new position. I think, um, I think it's going to be good for him uh, and for the industry to follow up what's happening after that, David Scorey, who has been heading up the rail efforts in Boston for Keolis, has been named um, president and CEO and interim basis of Keolis North America, replacing Clement. Congratulations to David Scorey. And then finally in news, um, interesting, the federal requirement for wearing face masks on public transportation uh, has been extended uh, for another four months, according to the TSA. Originally scheduled to expire on May 11th, the mask mandate has now been expanded by the Transportation Security Administration here in the U.S. to September 13th. Uh, And we'll see if that sticks. There's a lot of changes happening, but that's what just happened now. Hey, that's it for this headline news part of the show. As you know, each Comfort Corner comes in three packages, our headline news, then our newsmaker interview, which is coming up with uh, Julie Tim, who is the head of GRTC. Julie and I are going to be speaking at the upcoming Bus World uh, seminar coming up on the role of bus and motor coach in multimodal mobility world on Friday, June 4th at 3.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's going to be an exciting time for all of us. Uh, both her and I are passionate about what we're doing and about the role of bus and motor coach in a multi-mobility world. And, um, you know, mobility is a service and visions to provide door-to-door service via multimodal transportation services, et cetera. And so her and I are going to be speaking on that topic and the role of transit and um, how it came out at this Bus World conference. And I encourage you, if you haven't already registered, to look it up and um, potentially attend. It's, it's going to be a great session on June 4th, coming up right around the corner. Again, that is the Bus World North America Digital Summit being held June 2nd through 4th. And our discussion is the role of bus and motor coach in a multimodal mobility world. And now Julie Tim of the Greater Richmond Transit Company from her talk at Think Transit on equality, equity, and fairness in the transit system. I think there's a lot that we're doing in GRTC that reflects what you're hearing others are doing across the industry, what you yourselves might be doing across the industry. So really wanted to focus in on this presentation about a topic that's getting a lot of traction here in the Richmond, Virginia area, as well as nationally. And that's the idea about what do we do with fares long term? And is there an opportunity here to look at fares in a different way in the transit industry? The next slide, please. So I've I've struggled with this a lot in the past uh, year and a half, and I've been asked to speak to it a lot because GRTC is, among other agencies, taking a a little bit of a front leadership, I don't want to say leadership, but we're, we're heading the pack of people who are considering how do we handle fares moving forward? Can we afford uh, fares? And is it fair that people don't pay fares? And what's the fair market value? I'm, it just, the puns are amazing with just how we talk about it. And so I started thinking about what is the equity behind the fair and what are the economics behind fares? And I looked up fair market value And I don't want to talk too much about this slide right now. I just want you to kind of have in your mind the idea that when you look up fair market value and we think about transit as both a social need as well as a business that we have to run with efficiency and effectively, um, there's an idea that everyone should pay into the system and we should charge the fair market value. But when you start looking into what the definition of a fair market value, there's these underlying concepts that everyone has a reasonable knowledge of the facts of the system that everyone's willing 
buying and a willing seller and there's no pressure and everyone has an ability to to use the market and leverage the mar- market equally to make these decisions. And I think by the end of the presentation, you'll see that at least for Richmond, Virginia, uh, fares are not necessarily fair. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about GRTC, the background of who we are. We are the Greater Richmond Transit Company. Uh, we are the mass public mass transit company for the RVA region. Our region's about 1.3 million people. We'll see if that stays true for after the census numbers later this year. Uh, primarily, the majority of our service service is in the city of Richmond and also extends into Enrico with a service population area of about 500,000 people. Our predominant services are local bus, the commuter bus, uh, bus rapid transit, and paratransit services. Now, in the last two years is when uh, the bus rapid transit, the Pulse, was launched, as well as the system redesign. That was in 2018. And when that happened, GRTC, this is before I got here, I've been here for about 18 months now, GRTC started experiencing double-digit growth in ridership at a time when across the transit industry, a lot of regions were seeing single or even double digit drops in ridership as a national trend when gas prices were were shifting and the land uses were shifting. That was not GRTC. We had that growth. And based on that growth, we started seeing a a renewed interest in putting more money into transit to have more routes, more frequency, more extension into a truly regional system. Next slide, please. Uh, So what that looks like is the BRT went through the downtown portion of Richmond about a seven mile, uh, half of it's on dedicated right away. And it hasn't been there long enough to really show the, the trends of parcel values. So that that picture on the right, I get it. If you're into data and stats, um, that is wildly speculative. The dotted blue line is what the, the property value trends might have been pre-BRT and the red line are if the trends continue post-COVID, what property values could be post-GRT, uh, post uh, BRT, um, and uh, I would not think that they would actually continue to grow at that rate. But it, it shows you that an investment in high quality transit and investment in infrastructure does have an impact uh, when you also align it with good land use and good dense development. It does have an impact on the property value. So it's a good business investment for the region and for the community. Next slide, please. Um, on top of that, we talked about in 2018, when we launched that, there was also the system redesign to make sure that the local service connected into that and had reasonable connectivity. Um, when we're looking at 2022, we also received a new dedicated source of funding that we could use to expand service and stabilize our funding revenues. The uh, initial plan for the increased service and the increased frequency and the coverage would, uh, all the blue dots on the, the slide on the farthest right, are those areas where people could reach jobs, new jobs, better jobs within 45 minutes on transit. So it's greatly um, increasing the access of the populations uh, who are using transit or might use transit to jobs uh, more effectively and more efficiently. So this was the plan pre-COVID using dedicated funding, looking at that business model for making better decisions. Next slide, please. And then transit, and then COVID hit. And of course, once COVID hit, our our ridership dropped, our priorities shifted, not just to the business model that I was thinking of, but also the community need. Uh, our transit ridership did not drop as significantly as across the country. We saw a 30% drop right off. When we looked at it by mode, those three bars on the far left, when we looked at it by mode, BRT, the bus rapid transit in the downtown area that served the universities, the hospitals, uh, the state, since we're the capital, the state complex, the city complex, that did drop by 50%. Um, when we looked at our express routes, it's a very small percentage of our market that dropped significantly as people started teleworking. But the core portion of our ridership, we were on target to do 10 million trips in 2021 pre-COVID. The core bulk of that is associated with local bus service. And when COVID hit, that dropped about 22%. If we looked at the numbers now, we are back up on the local market close to where we were pre-pandemic. So our local service is is a critical part of the network. And even when we should have been social distancing and um, wearing masks and staying home, the people in our service 
could not stay home. They had to ride. They had to get to work. They needed the income to be able to pay their rent, to buy food, to get to the hospital, to get to health care. Um, we truly highlighted the essential services we provided to the region. When we started looking at that data by household income, by race and ethnicity, by fair payment, we started seeing some, some correlations that not only were we serving an essential market as our primary and core market, um, that population also had a significantly lower income. Um, majority of our ridership have incomes less than 25,000 a year. Um, a, a good portion of them, 26% have household incomes below 10,000 a year. The majority of them are um, African-American people of color and the majority of them also are paying for one day passes or they're paying cash pass. The most expensive way to ride transit when you have to ride regularly is to use a one day pass or use a cash pass. And that's what they were using. It was, it's the people who were using BRT and Express that got to telework who mostly weren't paying for transit because they had passes, either 30 day passes or um, university passes or seven day passes that were being paid for by their university that they were attended by their employer, by the state, they they were not paying it. Their business, their employer was paying it. Where when we looked at the local rider who was paying the cash fare, they were paying it, it was coming out directly out of their pocket. Next slide. So when we started looking at, okay, where not only do we know our rider, but what communities are they coming from? When we looked at how our local service was still very high in ridership, we were getting reports of buses still having 30 and 40 people on a 40 foot bus daily per bus. Where were they riding from and going to? And the, the lines in red are those lines that are core, our core service lines for local buses that had that high ridership. Uh, when we had the masks, we had the, the sanitation, we had the driver barriers, we had the zero fares, we had all the things that we needed to do to protect them as much as we could, except for social distancing. Um, and where were they coming from and going to? They were coming from and going to economically distressed areas where the job force um, has the essential workers with low household incomes. And the, the continuity of that service was not only important for them um, to be able to get to and from work, not only was it important for us to put the zero fares in to protect their health and protect the health of our operators, it, become, it became very clear to us and to my board and my region that Zero fares also was protecting them economically. So it got them a little bit of separation so they weren't sitting there putting the fares in and having that close contact while they put the fares in. But economically, it allowed them to have the extra trips they needed to get to and from work, to and from healthcare, to and from the store, and to be able to survive economically as we had the, the, the impacts of COVID health hurt us in those ways as well. Next slide, please. So we started saying, okay, well, if this is the case, if, if fares are really being um, so critically important and they're being born on the back of our low income, what does that really look like? And could we afford to go zero fares? What does that look like? When we were already looking pre-COVID at some of this, COVID just really accelerated our analysis. Um, $6.8 million of our budget of about a $63 million operational budget annually comes from fares. Of that, about 1.7 of it is associated with the expense of collecting fares. So if we didn't collect fares, um, we would be able to drop that $1.5 million from expenses, which leaves about $5.5 million left of a gap if we don't collect fares. I started thinking, who is it that's really paying that fare? We already talked about that the people who are white collar workers who are using the express buses, um, who are able to telework, most of them weren't paying their fares anyway. They were being paid by the university passes and by the, the state passes and by their employers the people working for Amazon. The majority of that $5.6 is coming from people who are riding local bus, a local bus service in the city of Richmond, which has a very high level of minority and a very high level of low income passengers and population compared to the region. So the dirty little secret, I think that many of us know is that the cash fare, the one ride fares, which is the backbone of our fare service, is being supported on the backs of our lowest income, most vulnerable populations. And that, that makes us rethink, is that truly fair market? Is that truly a, a system where we're setting our fares based on people's ability to reasonably decide what they can or can't do? Or are we setting our fares based on what we can charge just to have this concept of, well, it's fair that everyone pays. 
there, there's a lot to unpack in that and there's a lot to dig in to, okay, that's great, but what about paratransit? Okay, that's great, but what about, where do you get that five and a half million? That's great, but you know who's gonna pay it? We are looking at, at uh, avenues with state and federal partners as well as business partners to see over a couple of years, can we pilot this and can we find a way to backfill in instead of being a, a B to C business, a business to consumers on the back of low income populations, can we transform ourselves into a B to B where we are going straight to the Amazons, straight to the universities, straight to the businesses who are benefiting from the essential workers getting to and from their back door, their front door, can they be paying straight into the system as a service? And I think that there are models of that around the country and we'll be looking to see if we can transform ourselves over several years to fill that gap, to come off the back of low income and onto the support and growth of our businesses and uh, to make a better workforce for our community, for people to stay here, to, to invest here and to grow here. Next slide, please. Um, to sum it up, as we're looking at these ideas about zero fare, how to pilot it, what does that do to the funding gap? What does that do to our service model? We're looking at a new lens of environment, equity, and economy for GRTC and how zero fares fits into that, where instead of just being a company that puts buses on the street, that we really take a leadership role here about cha being a champion of those social and economic mobility needs about how transit is here to connect people, not just to put buses on the street, um, that we're here to protect the environment, not just to, um, to drive buses. And that is the transition that we're taking as we leave COVID over the next year of redefining who we are, redefining who our market is, and redefining how we use that as a decision lens for our infrastructure and our operational investments. I know this doesn't work for every uh, transit agency across the country, doesn't have the same market pressures, don't have the same business model, don't even have the same modal shifts that we have. So this isn't something that I think is universal, but it's certainly something that is very important to Richmond and it is very timely for us to consider. And I look forward to any questions you might have about this and how we proceed with it in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. I think that was so insightful. It's, it's leaving me with a lot of a lot of things to talk about in a few minutes, which I'm excited to get. And now, Alea Carey, continuing her series on email newsletters. This week, she talks about open rates, click rates, why you should care, and what you can do about them. Hi, I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. For the last few Comforts Corners, I've been talking about email newsletters and transit organizations. Today, we'll wrap up with how to use the information your email newsletter platform gives you to track the success of what you're sending out. All the popular email newsletter platforms, even the free versions, will give you some kind of analysis of how many people are seeing your newsletter and what they're doing with it. The most basic analytics have to do with how many people are opening your newsletter and if your readers are interested enough in the content that you're providing to click on a few links that you share. When you're looking at open rates, your email newsletter platform will very likely give you some kind of general industry standard to compare your open rate with. That's helpful context, but it's really quite broad. I would recommend that you track your own open rates over time to see if you're improving or to see if small changes you're making in content, like maybe a change of subject line, or if you start adding pictures and video, will get you a better open rate. Click-through rate in an email newsletter gives you some indication that people are opening the newsletter, reading or scanning it, finding a link that interests them, and clicking on it for further information. When I'm tracking how engaged my readers are with a newsletter, I try to make sure I have a link near the end of the newsletter to give me some indication that people are reading more than the first few lines. If you'd like to talk more about email newsletters or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Hey, now we're on to part three of the podcast, The Future of Public Transportation. I'm Paul Comfort. Thanks so much for being with us today and every week on Wednesdays. 
for our latest updates and latest episodes of Transit Unplugged. This last week, I'm excited to report to you that we broke all records for downloads of our podcast. Uh, it was amazing. We thank the thousands of listeners around the world. We're heard in 99 countries, as you know. And I think a big part of that reason was we released three special episodes, uh, which were the keynote addresses from the Trapeze Think Transit Conference. Uh, the Robbie Mackinnon keynote address, just phenomenal. Again, it's about the why of public transportation. Day, the, um, the day two with uh, Lauren Skyver uh, talking about line transit and the leadership around the industry and hydrogen and micro transit and all the things she's doing. And then on day three, another great interview with um, a discussion from Alex Wiggins from New Orleans and our uh, our other friends from Canada, both from the kind of East Coast and the West Coast, right? Phil Verster from Metrolink spoke. And then Aaron Pinkerton from BC Transit and a three-part series, a three-part uh, discussion on the final keynote. If you haven't had a chance to download and listen to those, I strongly encourage you to do so. It really informed my opinion about what I'm going to talk about right now, which is this idea of adding more equity and inclusion into transit and making sure that it's a lens through which everything we do is filtered. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I started my career working with the elderly and people with disabilities and ensuring that they had access to public transportation. Of course, in America, we had the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which created a civil right for people with disabilities. And I really see something similar happening now. It's a moment, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, as you know, has been a crisis, an existential crisis, really. I mean, there was articles about, are we on a, you know, a continual downward spiral? Uh, and it's a time, like Robbie said, Robbie Mackinnon, to re-examine why we exist. Is it just to provide, you know, the fastest connection for the masses rushing to work? No, I think it's also to provide access to all of life's opportunities. I mean, that was our mission um, statement, so to speak, at the um, where I used to work at the MTA in Maryland. And uh, I think now, you know, uh, up until now, and I'm interested in your feedback on this. This is kind of a philosophical underpinning of what I'm going to talk about today for the next 10 minutes. Let me know what you think. Send me an email after at poll.comfort at trapezegroup.com or contact me on LinkedIn and let me know your thoughts on this uh, philosophical underpinning of how moving forward with mobility on demand can really be a way to help a key to add equity and inclusion into transit and mobility. So I've been in the business now for uh, you know 33 years or more. And up until now, most agencies and governments felt like public transit's number one goal or our key performance indicator was ridership. That's how we determined if we were successful. That's why I remember back when I was CEO of the MTA in Baltimore in 2016, there was a panic among CEOs, and we talked about it at our APTA CEO conference. How can we increase ridership? And there was all this discussion because we'd had a downward trend for years. And then in 2016-17, there was a big push to increase ridership after a long spell of declining ridership called the Houston model. Our good friend Tom Lambert in Houston, the CEO there, was really the first agency to figure out how to turn around the ridership numbers in 2016. And then in 2017, seven more cities in the, in the U.S. and North America were able to do that, cities like Vegas and Seattle, and then more in 18. And then finally in 2019, finally the whole industry started to see an uptick in ridership. Even places like WMATA, where I used to work in Washington as a contractor, and New York were seeing upticks. And everyone was thrilled heading into 2020 that finally that we had solved this issue and uh, ridership was up. And then, of course, bam, the pandemic hits. There's shutdowns. People aren't allowed to ride transit unless you're an essential worker. And suddenly ridership, you know, falls out of the sky. So um, if uh, if ridership numbers were falling was the theory prior to 2020, 2020, then we weren't doing our job. We weren't achieving our reason to exist. But as I mentioned, the coronavirus pandemic put a halt to rising ridership as passenger counts plummeted 50 to 95 percent globally. Following the successful Houston model, agencies now began to coming out of COVID now on the back end of it, at least, uh, began to, again, reevaluate ridership trends, do the same kind of modeling, you know, where are people going now, right? Um, and uh, determine what type of routes, what type of service levels we should reemerge from this pandemic with to meet the needs of today's and tomorrow's riders. However, as part of this reevaluation, agencies and governments are also asking themselves if ridership patterns for commuter services, such as commuter trains and commuter buses, which take in people from the suburbs into the city, you know, to the big tall buildings, are they going to remain changed with lower peaks for the conceivable future? Because major businesses and downtowns are remaining kind of in a hybrid closed mode and not returning to the office five days a week. And it looks like that's the case around the world. Uh, Phil Verster just mentioned that at our 
recent Think Transit conference that they're looking at, you know, uh, higher levels of service during the middle of the day, nights, weekends, et cetera, other agencies are looking at. And the, the heavy AM going into the city and the heavy PM peaks coming out are going to be depressed for a while because people, I mean, we just saw, right, Citibank and other big corporations are saying you don't have to go back to the office five days a week in the big tall buildings in downtown. So because of that, uh, how should we adjust our service offerings? And what really are our end goals? Our reason for our reason for being. During the pandemic, public transit existed primarily to provide mobility for our essential workers, and ridership levels in most cities remained around 50% for core bus service as a result. Transit, as it turns out, is not just for, quote, choice commuters hustling to their eight to five jobs in the big tall buildings. It actually is the backbone of our economy because it provides mobility and access for employees to the key jobs that are required for our economy and our society to properly function, right? These are what they were saying, you know, only ride if you're an essential worker. What are the essential workers? Things like grocery store clerks, pharmacy techs called critical retail, energy and infrastructure workers, first responders and medical staff, agricultural and food production, transportation, warehouse and delivery and the like. These were the folks that were riding the transit system during the peak of the pandemic. So public transportation is not only to serve the, quote, mass transit needs of white collar commuters, but it's also to underpin the mobility needs of the frontline workers running our daily economy and society, then it appears our overarching key performance indicator of ridership may be a false idol, in my opinion. Remember, you know, I've always said this in my teachings, you don't want to climb the ladder of success your whole career only to find out it was leaning against the wrong wall. I've always been concerned about ridership as our number one key performance indicator. I remember when I was at MTA and I said, you know, that's the one number we really can't directly affect. We have to build a great system. The old theory, if you build it, they will come. And you know, we need to communicate to them and put in the right technology and all that stuff. But we really can't you know, force people to ride the bus. And so why is that our number one key performance indicator of success? I questioned it. And I still do. And I think a lot of people are doing it. As a matter of fact, I think that uh, what we found now is public transit does not only exist to provide mass transportation for commuters, but also to provide mobility access for all people to all of life's opportunities. As our good friend and industry leader, Robbie Mackinnon said during his keynote address on day one of Think Transit, we exist to help people. That is our reason, DHR. that's our reason to exist. So have our altars to higher ridership fallen? Well, based on a fall 2020 American Public Transportation Association transit agency survey, it looks like they have. Transit agencies now have reordered their priorities. They responded, Scores of them did to the survey and said now their number one key performance indicator, their number one measurement of success is no longer ridership, it is customer satisfaction. After that is ridership, and finally, access to mobility options. Let's dig into that and unpack that. The recent successful U.S.-based model to reboot our bus networks from 2016 to 19, what I call the Houston model, can continue to be useful as we phase through COVID into a new normal, in my opinion. Here's a template that can continue to work, in my opinion. First off, this is what we did. You know, Kevin Quinn, who was my head of planning and now was my, was my successor at the MTA, is doing a great job as administrator there. He was really the architect of this for Baltimore. And we took 10 people down to Houston from our team and met with Tom Lambert and his team. And they shared with us, we took eight people, I'm sorry, and they shared with us 10 lessons, really, that they had learned that I pulled out of that, that we integrated into our Baltimore Link plan. And other transit agencies around the country have done similarly. Here's my take on what it is. Figure out where people are going today and provide bus route networks to take them there. Many of these bus routes were laid out 50 years ago when the heaviest concentrations of jobs and transportation needs, trip generators, were in the central business district. But now that businesses and trip generators have located outside the central business district, these routes need to be reconfigured to take people where the jobs and trip drivers are today. Then we have to set up standards for bus routes and stops, right? That don't re that require certain levels of productivity before we run a 40 foot bus down them on a regular basis. I was, you know, confronted in Baltimore with uh, a spaghetti string of routes and bus stops, sometimes two bus stops on a block, and um, and the routes that went all over and weren't straight because they'd been uh, changed over the years to the varying political pressures, and no one had ever kind of gone through and and um, restraightened them all out. So. Uh, Putting in standards to say you have to have X amount of people per hour, productivity standard, on a bus route or at a bus stop helps you create more efficiency in the routes so that the bus routes don't meander and take forever to get where they're going and people don't want to ride as a result of that. 
removing routes and stops that don't meet these standards to adequately shepherd resources. We went from 6,000 bus stops to 5,000 bus stops overnight in our plan. And we adjusted probably two thirds of the routes, some of them off streets and moved on to other streets. So then you had to add frequency to the routes where most people want to ride at 10 to 15 minute headways. We created something called CityLink. There were 12 color coded routes that pulsed into and out of the central business district on 15 minute headways. So that you didn't need a schedule, a printed schedule. You could stand there just like it was a subway, so to speak, and wait for the bus to come. And then you add in bus only lanes, transit signal priority, good vehicle tracking, boarding and fairing policies to improve the overall speed, the mile per hour of the service, and make it more efficient. Giving the buses priority means they don't get stuck in the same rush hour traffic as cars, and it makes them more attractive as a faster and more convenient mobility solution. And then finally, you integrate your various modes to work more well together, such as light rail, subway, regional rail, and bus. Bus is the one that can be modified to link them all together with protection modes for passengers and good real-time rider info, both on their cell phones, their platforms, and in vehicles, to ensure that transfers can be effectively made. In Baltimore, when I got there, we were effectively running four different transit systems. We had a subway system that was built you know, 30 years ago, a light rail system that was built 25 years ago, the bus routes that followed a lot of the old trolley routes that was 50 years ago, and then a commuter train system called MARC, and they all ran independently, and they never really linked up. It's a big reason why we called it Baltimore Link. We had to connect them. But then you need the, uh, you know, the good technology to make sure that they connect well and people aren't missing connections. So that's all wonderful and it works and it's been shown to work in my opinion. Then at this point, I think you have to add in our reason for existing. Help people access all of life's opportunities. What does it look like from there? Well, now look at it with the lens of equity and inclusion and see where the gaps are. Have you moved routes or stops away from some people that really need them and have really no other options, but just don't ride on a regular daily basis, perhaps, or with not enough frequency to justify the productivity standards to run a 40-foot bus down their street or to the bus stop. These may include people of color, lower income, elderly passengers. Similar to how the Americans with Disabilities Act made public transportation a civil right for people with disabilities, the most vulnerable actually need public transportation more than the less vulnerable who have other options. I believe our job is to ensure equity and inclusion is to make sure that they don't get disenfranchised with these service changes. Adding in mobility on demand, microtransit, which is the hottest trend coming out of COVID in my opinion, fills the gaps. It ensures that no one is left behind. Passengers can call in or use a handheld phone app or on their computer to plan, book, and pay for their trips seamlessly and eventually subscribe to the service. And it doesn't clog our streets unnecessarily with individualized trips but it uses a shared ride model with software that has powerful algorithms to determine the best pickup time and locations to maximize trip productivity, balanced with on-time performance. I believe each agency, as they look at this and analyze what's the role of microtransit, should make sure that they have the best possible technology to ensure passengers can easily use a powerful mobility on-demand app. And you can run this yourself like LA Metro is doing with their pilot or outsource it to private providers. Uh, who are experts in this. Using mobility on demand as a layer on top of a rebooted bus or rail network, I believe can ensure access to mobility options for all, making sure no one is left behind and that there is more equity and inclusion. Microtransit, mobility on demand, in my opinion, is a sort of a safety net. Using this enhanced model, I believe public transportation will have a new lease on life, a new purpose, and new measurements for success that we can meet. What do you think? Let me know. That's my theory. I've been working on it. I kind of had an epiphany the other night when I couldn't sleep and, and put down all, a lot of these thoughts and then fleshed it out. And as I said, I'm working with Alex Wiggins and others to, to uh, really um, purify this and make it, I think, very useful as a model and a tool for our industry to look at what's coming next for us coming out of COVID. Let me know what you think. Email me at paul.comfort at trapezegroup.com or reach out to me in a private message on LinkedIn and let me know. Thank you so much for being part of our worldwide phenomenon, Transit Unplugged, as we continue to light the way on our industry's future. Thank you and stay safe out there. Now it's time for Mike's Minute. Where Mike tells us about a little random act of kindness he did. It seemed to have a really big result. Let's hear it from Mike. Hi, this is Mike Bismeyer, Regional Sales Director for Proterra, and this is Mike's Minute, where we talk about 
mentorship, leadership, and kindness with the hopes it'll inspire you to pay it forward. Well, I'm hoping that I may be able to inspire you this week by talking about a simple random act of kindness. This past week, I had the opportunity, unbeknownst to myself, to be the first customer in the grand opening of a new Starbucks drive through I decided to pay it forward for the next 10 cars behind me. The manager thought it was an incredible gesture and took my name. Later in the week, she reached out to tell me what a wonderful vibe I had set for her team's grand opening. They were super excited, created a lot of smiles, and the pay it forward lasted till about 10 a.m. So why am I telling you about this? Well, I also posted about it on LinkedIn. It's received over 6,000 views. And I think it just shows that we're all creating a little more positivity in our lives. We understand that it's easy to change someone's tomorrow. Simple gestures. I challenge you all this week to go out and commit a random act of kindness. It will make you feel good and somebody will feel even better. Thanks for listening. Kindness is cool. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this week's Comforts Corner with our special guest, Julie Tim of GRTC. Next week, Paul is chatting with Esmil Hassan Al-Bluchi, CEO of RAK Transport Authority, Raz al Kama, United Arab Emirates. So until next week, I hope you all ride happy and have a great week. <laughs>